Good morning. I'd like to welcome the subcommittee and the Honorable Tara uh, Katuk, McLean uh, Sweeney, the Assistant uh, Secretary of Indian Affairs to the Department of Interior at the Department of Interior. This is your first time testifying. I had an opportunity to meet you um, a couple weeks ago. It was delightful. Um, and we're very happy to have you here at the subcommittee today. Joining Ms. Sweeney is uh, Joanna Blackhair, acting, uh, acting Deputy Director of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, which we will be referring to as uh, BIA, uh, the rest of the committee. And uh, joining also on the team is Tony Dearman, Director of the Bureau of Indian Education, which we'll be referring to as BIE. <laughs> I like to kind of get the alphabet soup cleared for anybody um, who is joining us today. Um, our hearing today will address the President's FY 2020 budget request of $2.68 billion for BIA and BIE. That is a reduction of $292 million, a reduction of almost 10% from the 19, uh, uh, from the 2019 enacted level. Uh, one of the issues we heard from, from tribal leaders when we were having our public testimony with, with the tribal nations was climate change. It's real and is having a disproportionate impact on Native people's lands and infrastructure. Yet the President's uh, FY2020 budget once again proposes to eliminate the Tribal Climate Resilience Cooperative Landscape Activities and proposes an overall $23 million reduction for the Natural Resources Account. Now these accounts fund important activities to combat climate change, uh, reflects on the natural and cultural resources that are vital vital to um, native uh, livelihoods and substance. So this uh, committee has uh, been educated well by our tribal uh, leaders of how important these critical funding uh, is and how important these, these programs are in their daily lives and the future of their tribal nations. So um, another topic uh, that we heard from them loud and clear uh, had to do with Congress making sure that we provided over the past two years for public safety and justice construction. The President once again proposes no funding for, to construct these facilities. In the House report uh, of fiscal year 2018, the committee uh, stated our concern about the growing needs for justice facility funding, and we encouraged the BIA to develop a master plan. Uh, detailing the location and the condition of existing justice facilities um, relative to uh, user population. <coughs> Unfortunately, the Bureau did not take steps to do this, so in fiscal year 2019, it was necessary for the committee to direct BIA uh, to maintain such a plan. It is our expectation that that will be used to prioritize facilities replacement and new construction. Also this morning, I look forward to hearing about the status of the master plan when the committee will receive a copy of how uh, fiscal year 2019 public safety and justice construction funds will be distributed in accordance with it. As part of the 2019 appropriations bill, the committee also encouraged the Department of Interior to align the, the Office of Special Trustee Reorganization Efforts with the Indian Trust Asset Reform Act, which I'm going to refer to as ITERA. In 2019, Congress approved the Department's request to transfer the Office of Special Trustee out of the Office of the Secretary, moving it under the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs. The Office of Special Trustee was originally supposed to sunset in the 90s. It did not do so. And Congress passed ITERA, which was enacted into law in 2016 directing the department to report to Congress within two years on how to sunset the office. These two years have come and gone, and in order to meet the uh, requirements of ITERA, I think the report must include a plan to sunset the entire office of special trustee, not just eliminate the position of special trustee. This report is long overdue, and I'm sure tribal leaders and the rest of Congress will uh, uh, join me in hoping that we can read the report soon, and we look forward to reading and working with you on the implementation of closing this down. Last month, the committee held two days of hearings, as I mentioned, on the funding priorities for Indian Country. We, ju we heard how this administration is not, is not protecting treaty and trust obligations. 
The proposed cut to the budget lines confirmed that this is true. And I can assure you that we will, um, nonpartisanly working together, be rejecting these proposed cuts. Turning to the Bureau of Indian Education, the FY 2020 budget proposes to establish the BIE as a separate bureau. And I look forward to hearing in more detail how this proposal will meet the GAO recommendations, the extent of tribal consultation on this specific proposal, and how this will improve the quality of uh, Indian education for our Native students. I do not recall the last time Congress has not provided funding to BIE to, for school replacement. So it makes no sense to me that the administration does not have a five-year construction plan for school replacement based on either last year's appropriated amount or the president's budget, whichever is higher. If uh, school construction uh, in five years spend list is somehow, if it's top secret information, let us know. All of us have security clearances, but we want to know what is going on with school construction. <laughs> Um, we're, we're accustomed to handling routine um, sensitive information, but this shouldn't be, this should all be public and there should be no secret about it because this committee supports school construction and reconstruction. And the 2018 uh, Government Accountability uh, Office, GAO, recommended uh, to uh, ensure health and safety in Indian school facilities. Last month, GAO reported that there are still two open priority recommendations for BIE. We want to work with you to resolve these. The two are, one, is document and collect that school inspection information is complete and accurate, and two, to provide information on how the department plans to support BIE school personnel in fixing safety hazards. The administration's proposed 71% reduction, or $170 million increase in education construction combined with a proposed $2 million increase in facilities operation will not help the department meet these GAO recommendations. Another issue that's important to students is uh, Johnson O'Malley. Last year, Congress enacted the Johnson O'Malley Supplemental India Ed Education Modernization Act. The law requires the secretary to publish a preliminary report <coughs> describing the number of eligible Indian students served or potentially served by eligible entities under the law within 180 days of enactment. We are fast approaching those six months for the deadline. So as a sponsor of the House legislation, and I think just about everybody on the committee was also on that legislation, we are curious about the status of the preliminary report and whether there's any challenges that have been identified in determining the number of, an, uh, of eligible Indian students and how we can help you achieve our mutual goal. Much more work is needed to be done to fulfill our obligation to our Native American brothers and sisters. It is our responsibility as the federal government to honor treaty and trust responsibilities. The proposed budget cuts don't help us do that. So Assistant Secretary Sweeney, I look forward, and I sincerely mean this, working with you to address the challenges of Indian country and the challenges that the department are, is facing now. So I'd like to yield to our ranking member, Mr. Joyce, for any opening remarks he'd like to make. Thank you for being here. Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Madam Chair, <clears throat> and I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Assistant Secretary Sweeney and her leadership team here. Uh, thank you for all the dedicated work you do at the department on behalf of uh, Indian Country and for being with us today to discuss the fiscal 2020 <coughs> budget and the needs for Indian Affairs. Um, current law mandated the President submit a fiscal 20 year 2020 budget proposal to Congress that would cut non-defense discretionary spending by 9%. In contrast with the proposal for Indian Health Service, which is a 2% increase, the proposal for Indian Affairs is a 9% cut, uh, <coughs> commensurate with the overall non-defense discretionary total. I point this out not to suggest that health care programs are a priority, but to suggest that the federal government can and must do a better job of coordinating and prioritizing its budget for Indian country. Whether or not the President and Congress can agree to raise the budget caps for the next fiscal year remains to be seen. But I applaud my friend and chair of this subcommittee for fighting for a larger percentage allocation to help pay for the obligations to Indian country, which, though on a discretionary side of the ledger, are certainly not optional. These are true have-to-do programs in this bill. Now we are, uh, no doubt our witnesses today are simply playing the hand they're dealt. So there's little value in asking them to defend the proposed cuts unless there are true savings that should be uh, reinvested elsewhere in Indian Affairs budget. Instead, I want to start by giving credit to our witnesses for finally proposing to strengthen the Bureau of Indian Education. 
as an independent bureau. By having the BIE gradually assume direct responsibility for acquisition, safety, and facilities management, you are acting on a congressional direction led by this subcommittee and recommendations made by the GAO. But more importantly, you are giving the director of BIE the authority to match his responsibilities. In doing so, you are helping to put an end to the dangerously high turnover rate at the director position. It is a testament to both his performance and to the changes underway at BIE that our distinguished witness here today, Mr. Tony Dearman, is the 37th director in 35 years. Uh, is well on his way to becoming the longest service to serving director. So thank you for your service. Before being elected to Congress, I served as a public defender and then as a county prosecutor for 25 years. That's why I'm particularly interested in public safety and justice programs at Bureau of Indian Affairs. I'm pleased to see that the uh, FY20 budget proposes a $2.5 million increase to fight opioid abuse and addiction in Indian Country, and I look forward to learning today more about those efforts. I'm disappointed, however, in the proposed 70 percent cut to public safety and justice construction. Just like schools and hospitals, the federal government has a trust responsibility to provide police stations, courts, and detention centers in Indian Country. And with the Department of Justice no longer providing grants for construction, uh, and with a proposal to eliminate the replacement construction in the BIA, I fear that the federal government may be walking away from this responsibility altogether. The weight of responsibility upon this subcommittee to fix these things and more is tremendous, and we cannot do it alone. Fortunately, we are not alone. Many of our colleagues in Congress understand that meeting our trust responsibility and legal obligations to American Indians and Alaska Natives is a responsibility shared by all members of Congress. Madam Chair, thank you again for holding this important hearing today. I look forward to working with you and the rest of our colleagues in the coming days and weeks to do what we can to provide the resources in fiscal year 2020 to meet this responsibility. I yield back. So, Assistant Secretary Sweeney, uh, we're used to, especially here in the House, <coughs> running by a time clock. So um, we're going to uh, allocate five minutes if you need to go just a little over. Please feel free to do so. Your full testimony will be entered into the record along with any testimony you'd like to enter, Mr. 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 Dearman, on, on the work that you're doing on uh, BIE. So with that, Ms. Sweeney. Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the committee, my name is Tara McLean Sweeney, and I am the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior. So thank you for the opportunity to testify. During my service at Interior, I have focused on three critical components to improve economic development and the quality of life in and for Indian country. First, analyzing the current state of operations and executing administrative adjustments to improve service delivery. It is the responsibility of Indian Affairs to deliver efficient and effective services to Indian country as we continue to work to meet our trust responsibilities and treaty obligations. Second, addressing the social challenges in our communities, specifically building a strategy to address our Native American focused cold cases, violent crimes, and missing and murdered Native American women, children, and men. Finally, taking a proactive approach to building an economic roadmap for development and growth in Indian country. This must be done in partnership with our tribal leadership, tribal enterprises, Alaska Native and Village corporations, tribal native-owned financial institutions, the financial sector, and of course, Congress. This year will be the first year we have separate budget requests for both BIA and BIE. This change increases transparency, accountability, and autonomy of BIE and separates congressional justification for each of the two organizations. The net effect will be that BIE will gradually assume direct responsibility for acquisition, safety, and facilities management. This committee has regularly scheduled report language and other congressional direction, and we appreciate that continued support. I also appreciate the funding provided by this committee in the 2019 Appropriations Bill for innovative financing of school infrastructure. These funds will support implementation of a model that will allow Indian Affairs to leverage financing to address infrastructure needs more quickly and to foster economic development in Indian Country. The 2020 President's Budget for Indian Affairs is $2.8 billion. This budget supports the administration's commitment to empower tribal communities and help Interior maintain a strong and productive government-to-government -government relationship with tribes. 
The request for BIE is $936.3 million. This funding supports 169 BIE schools and 14 dormitories, providing educational services to 47,000 individual students in 23 states. The budget also proposes $20.9 million for early child and family development and continues to promote educational self-determination for tribal communities by including $81.5 million to fully fund tribal grant support costs for tribes that choose to operate BIE-funded schools. The request also preserves funding for core services and reflects the full transition of Haskell and SIPI to forward funding. The request includes $42.6 million for education management. Funding includes $32.3 million for education program management, an increase of $7.3 million, which will enable BIE to build much-needed capacity in acquisition, school safety and repairs, performance tracking, and technical support to the field. In addition to the administration's Public Lands Infrastructure Fund legislative proposal, the 2020 budget includes $68.9 million in annual funding for education construction focused on facility improvement and repair. Available funding from prior years will complete school construction on the 2004 school replacement list and continue design-build construction for schools on the 2016 replacement list. The 2020 budget for BIA and Asia is $1.9 billion. The request prioritizes base funding for tribes and fully funds contract support costs at $285.9 million and provides an additional $2.5 million for law enforcement priorities such as opioids. The request meets our legal obligations for enacted water settlements by including $45.6 million. The 2020 budget includes $326 million for programs that support tribal governments, including $178.9 million for self-governance compacts. The budget also includes $34.9 million for road maintenance to support pavement and gravel maintenance, remedial work on roads, bridges, and snow and ice control. I am committed to empowering Indian country and utilizing taxpayer dollars to support this goal as efficiently and as effectively as possible. And so I look forward to working with the committee and the members of Congress and this administration to accomplish these goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sweeney. I'm going to uh, save my question on the Tuahi Initiative for later in the questioning as I will be here for the whole uh, hearing. Um, Mr. Joyce, would you like to go first or should I start with some of the committee members? I would start with the committee members. Okay. Um, Ms. Pingree. <coughs> Uh oh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you so much uh, for testifying today and for the work you do um, for all of our constituents in Indian country. Um, the chair talked quite a bit about some of the challenges in, in education and I'll just start with a question around that. Um, so um, everyone on this committee knows uh, who's been here while I've been here um, that we've been working for a very long time um, to get funding for the Beatrice Rafferty School in the Passamaquoddy Reservation. And we're so grateful. Three weeks ago we heard that the funding is done, the tribe can move forward, and the um, contract can proceed, which is great because um, we have a short construction season in Maine, and as soon as it stops raining, um, I think they'll be anxious to get to work. So thank you. But as you know, for the past several years, we've had a lot of starts and stops. There were promises made and not kept, changes in designs and the costs. Um, and a lot of things that kept the project um, from getting off the ground. So we're excited to get, be on the right track, but I thought it might be useful to hear you talk a little bit about, you know, what can we, what, what can you be doing at the department that, um, you know, makes it more efficient to get these dollars out the door? What, what holds these projects up and slows us down? Because obviously this is a critical need in, in so many communities. Um, the other part I just wanted to mention um, is around broadband, and uh, of course that's critically important I think in, in all schools everywhere today, and, and Maine is like so many other states, we're a very rural state. Um, this is in a very rural community, and um, there's not a lot of connectivity and there's not a lot of speed. So it's really exciting that there will be broadband in the school, and it'll be really important to the mission. My understanding is that um, we won't be able to use the same broadband and same facility for tribal offices. And one of my questions is, you know, then they'll have to find another way, another way of digging and it's an expensive system. So just maybe address a little bit about broadband and that funding and how to make sure those processes are streamlined as well. So I'll let you hold forth whoever wants to talk about it. 
Mr. Dearman. First off, Chair McCollum, I want to thank the committee for the support, as you stated in your opening remarks, of uh, the support that the committee's given BIE in the, the past, and we really appreciate that. Beatrice Rafferty, um, really feel like th that shows you what we can do when we go to work with our tribes, and we, one thing that Ms. Sweeney has done since she's came in is she's pulled us all together. Because in education, it's unique. There's so many departments across Indian Affairs that have their hand in on BIE. And one of the things that Ms. Sweeney has done is she's pulled us all in the room and started getting us to streamline and coordinate activities to make sure we can support our schools. Um, Beatrice Rafferty, I think one way that we can eliminate that from happening is be at the table at the forefront. And our Division of Facilities and Management and Construction will continue working with uh, Maine Indian Education who the tribe is actually working with in the construction project, but really being up front from the beginning to the end through the whole planning phase to make sure that this don't happen again. But uh, we have started doing that because I know that uh, DFMC, which is Division of F Facilities uh, Management Construction, is really actively involved now with the schools, with the tribes. So that's a process that's really improved. Broadband, another area where we work across the Department of Interior Right now, we are actually doing assessments um, because we have such unique systems across our system that we have to prioritize just like what was brought up in our facilities. And we're working with uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Management Division to make sure that all the schools are prioritized because we are converting to a new system, um, Windows 10, and uh, we're finding out that a lot of our computers in our schools are not going to support it. So we're starting to address that as well. Um, but we are doing assessments. We're prioritizing that, and um, that is another thing that we have improved at, at the department is they are actually at the table with VIE and everyone else that has a hand in on school operations. Regarding broadband, I want to stress that broadband connectivity is a priority for Indian Affairs. Uh, coming from the Arctic and understanding the difficulty of connecting very remote communities is something that helps inform our decisions at the department. And so if there are connectivity issues uh, for your tribal communities with respect to the, the uh, laying of the cable for uh, the school, we're open to working uh, across the federal government to see what options are available for the tribal community. And this is an issue that I'm uh, very familiar with. When a, a, a federal infrastructure project comes into a community and they're afforded certain services, but that last mile of connectivity for the entire community uh, cannot uh, access those same services, I understand that situation. And so what I want to do is offer our assistance in uh, working through that issue. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you for that. And it's, um, I, I appreciate Mr. Dearman's praise for you on helping to bring disparate areas together on the school construction. Because again, I don't know if we have worked on this the entire 10 years I've been in Congress, but certainly all the years I've been on this committee. And there have been great um, support from other chairs and both sides of the aisle. And I know we've had to work really hard, but not every district has a member of Congress that knows that they're trying to build a school and um, you know, those particular problems. So I hope going into the future that, um, you know, with your support I in your department, as you said, um, you're able to, you know, work from the very beginning because it seems like some of the obstacles we had to work through on the school construction and design, um, I understand they presented challenges to, you know, every line in, in the budget, but they were all worked through and they just took some time. So thank you for that. And certainly on broadband, thank you for your answer. Um, uh, it just seems critically important. So we'll be back in touch with you about how maybe this community can look at exactly what you said. If, if the broadband's coming in, that's a big deal. And we wanna make sure that there's more access than just the schools. Um, certainly, as you mentioned, school connectivity is really important and I won't, I'm gonna run out of time, so I won't delve into this. And I'm, I'm not the biggest computer geek in Congress, but there are some I know, and it seems to me Windows 10 is, is a very old system itself. So if you're upgrading to Windows 10, I may, I'm not, a sad reflection. I'm not an IT person either. I may probably, I probably did misquote that, but I know that we're doing upgrades. Mm -hmm. um, 
when you start talking gigabits and gigabytes and all of that, I'm lost as well. But all I know is that we are moving forward and making things better for our kids. Well, I certainly hope you are getting them, you know, in, into this century when it comes yeah. to computer technology and and we'll connect with you again on, on um, making sure that happens because it seems like it would be terrible if we couldn't do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. The only other thing I'll add to the conversation, Ms. <coughs> Pingree, is we'll make sure, working with Mr. Dearman, that they have modern windows. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Mr. Stewart. Madam Chairman, thank you again to the witnesses. Uh, and particularly, Ms. Blackhair, we have some common history. I don't know if you consider yourself Utah, but we would certainly welcome you and adopt you. You spent time there and worked there. Uh, your, your family's still in Utah? Yeah. Get a second opinion on that. <laughs> <laughs> Idaho's not far away. Yeah. <laughs> I have family um, there too. <laughs> being, in, being in the West, and my district has some very rural parts of the West, we recognize that our Native American community has some special challenges, and we know that you're committed and working hard to try and help on those challenges. And I think, frankly, the federal government has some special responsibilities to try and help you. That's the reason we're here today. Uh, we, we have a problem, and we need your help. Not surprised to hear me say that. If if you look at my district or the West or, or Southern Utah, I mean it's magnificent. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable terrain and territory. I, I can take you to a hundred places where we could put you on a mountaintop and look in a hundred miles in every direction, and see not a trace of evidence of man, not a road, not a power line, nothing. Mm -hmm. Which is w one of the reasons it makes it really special. It's also one of the reasons it's a real challenge. And the thing I'm talking about in this case is uh, medevac, uh, medevac helicopters, particularly up to till two, until two years ago, we had a number of different private companies that were providing medevac services in the Four Corners region. Uh, and they were able to do that because they were compensated at a market rate. And they're going great distances. It's not like providing services in an urban area where you might fly a couple miles, and they're flying hundreds of miles in some cases. Very expensive uh, to provide helicopter service to do that. Two years ago, IH, IHS changed their compensation, and they're losing money on virtually every flight. Not a single flight are they making a penny or even breaking even. They're losing thousands of dollars, even in, in total millions of dollars. And so many of them have left. Most of them have left leaving in some cases one in Utah and maybe one or two that are providing from Arizona side. Th 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 they're taking about 100 patients a year. That's every three days they're doing these flights and losing, as I said, tens of thousands of dollars. We've got to find a way to fix it or we're going to leave that community without medevac service. And imagine that. I mean, if you're hours away from the nearest hospital, under the best of circumstances, hours away. In the weather or others, it may be longer than that. And you lose that medevac service, and those, those patients will die, many of them. Uh, but we can't force private companies to stay there if they're losing money. Now, we know several, uh, Classic Helicopter, which I've met with several times, they're committed to staying there even though they're losing money, but they can't do it forever. And so we need your help. I mean, the, very f the first thing we would ask is to modify the compensation so that they're not, they're not losing money and, and take it back to the market rate rather than the Medicaid reimbursement, which just doesn't work in that area of the, of the country. And uh, the way we might propose you know, a, a test market or perhaps um, a pilot program in that region to try to you know, look at the cost and look at the benefits. Can we get your help on that, do you think? Absolutely, we would be, we would be uh, very interested in working with you and with IHS to explore what those options look like. Again, I come from uh, the Arctic, remote Alaska, and certainly understand the importance of uh, immediate medical assistance. So the situation that you've raised resonates with me. Well, and, and I'll just, I won't belabor it, I'll just conclude by saying we're, we're in a rock and a hard spot. You can't compel a private company to provide these services if they're losing millions of dollars. On the other hand, we can't leave these communities without the service, but we can't fix it. W you, you guys can, and um, we'd like to follow up with you if we could, Ms. Sweeney and others. I know that you'll have to, you know, have your staff and, and delegate this, but I it's reaching a point now where it's urgent, or we're going to leave the community without, you know, without EMS, and it's unacceptable that we would do that. Thank you. Thank you. Yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. It's a problem in Utah. It's a problem all over, and 
being a former city council member even in our municipalities um, many of them have stopped providing ambulance service uh, and tried to contract things out now because EMS service is expensive and we're not reimbursing the full cost of it. So thank you for bringing that up. Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks for being with us. Um, as, as you may know, uh, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights um, issued a report back in December titled Broken Promises, Continuing federal funding shortfalls for Native Americans. And as the title suggests, it presents a pretty devastating uh, condemnation of the federal government's really systemic failure to meet its treaty and trust responsibilities. And uh, to make matters worse, it's actually a follow-up on a report that the commission had previously done qu called the Quiet Crisis Report, uh, which had documented a lot of these shortcomings almost two decades ago. Uh, I am uh, extremely disappointed that Congress and the BIA and federal agencies failed to act on these recommendations the first time around. And I think it's really important that this report doesn't just get stuck on a shelf somewhere, doesn't fall on deaf ears. And I really appreciate that our chair and our ranking member and the members of this committee want to make sure that that is the case, that, that we actually do something with these recommendations. And I really hope we can count on uh, your support in that regard as well. I have three quick questions on uh, on that front. Um, we heard uh, last month from a number of tribal re leaders and representatives from across the country who spoke firsthand about some of those systemic problems, housing issues, economic development challenges, healthcare disparities. One of the things that the um, report calls out is specifically challenges uh, for um, around uh, self-governance and self-determination. And I don't know yet if the BIA has any sort of specific plans of action in light of the Civil Rights Commission's recommendations in that regard. If you could speak briefly to that, I've got a couple other questions I want to get to. Well, we have, thank you uh, for your question. Uh, we have a very robust self-governance program uh, and uh, a very robust uh, 638 uh, program inside of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So I'm curious as to uh, if there is anything specific regarding those two programs that you would like to have additional information on. Terrific. Um, perhaps we can follow up. And um, in that regard, we're, I'm working to convene a congressional panel discussion with the chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. It's scheduled for June the 5th to discuss some of the specific policy actions that could be taken um, in follow-up to the Broken Promises report. And I'd personally like to invite you to that uh, discussion. I think it'd be valuable to have the BIA's uh, perspective represented there. Thank you. Um, the other question I wanted to ask uh, was perhaps, I think one of the most devastating uh, consequence of these inequities is the emerging crisis focused on um, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Uh, over the past years, there have been some growing efforts to shine a light on what was once a silent epidemic, um, thanks largely to, this, uh, to Seattle's Urban Indian Health Institute, which uh, self-funded a comprehensive report on this issue. Um, it was devastating to learn that Washington State had the second highest number of mm -hmm. cases nationwide, that Seattle and Tacoma were among the top five cities in the country uh, impacted uh, by this problem. And I'm very grateful that the Urban Institute, uh, the Urban Indian Health Institute, um, is continuing to work this issue so that uh, uh, we don't sort of stay the course on this. Unfortunately, there's been a systemic lack of data, uh, and that's made it difficult to fully document this problem, let alone to fix it. And um, I, I, I think their report is really the most comprehensive um, accounting of this crisis to date. I understand one of your priorities um, is to take steps to begin actually combating this crisis. So I'd be interested in um, hear what you're working on on that front. Thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, missing and murdered uh, women and children, uh, our focus is on Alaska Native and American Indian uh, women, children, and uh, and men, and. Uh, our Office of Justice Services has taken a very holistic approach and looking at ways where uh, we are looking in at areas where we need to uh, improve uh, our outreach, our um, engagement in the communities. Uh, 
when you look at the social challenges facing Indian country, you're absolutely correct in your statement that there is a lack of data. And that is a challenge that we have found internally with the Office of Justice Services. So how do we improve the, the quality and the integrity of that data? Uh, and Office of Justice uh, Services has been working with NamUs uh, so that uh, when a, an individual, a victim, is uh, received, uh, identified that there is the appropriate tribal affiliation that is included in that database. And that helps us with tracking, but that is after the fact. And so what we are looking at as uh, Indian Affairs is how do we combat this uh, in a very holistic manner. So taking a look at the violent crimes, the sexual assault, the domestic violence, uh, looking at cold cases, uh, working across uh, the federal government to have it a mechanism so that we can look at cold cases that specifically focus on Indian country, in addition to working with our tribal law enforcement officials and other federal partners uh, to educate and, and combat uh, violent behavior that is affecting Indian country. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I yield back. Um, I'm going to take your, your second left and, and, and ask a question. How are you interconnecting with First Nations? Many of us live on the northern tier here. Um, some, um, Mr. Simpson has more mountains than, and Ms. Pingree has more mountains than, than in, in rough land than I do, but in the, in the plains and in Minnesota and Wisconsin and that, our borders are, you know, people go back, back and forth. And I know the Canadian government's been working on it. And maybe we need to have conversations with the Canadian parliament um, because I really, a lot of this is uh, between between our borders. If if I hear right on Canadian uh, radio, what how they're addressing, maybe talk about the international aspect of this a little bit, and that's one of the reasons why some of the cases go so cold, as no one really takes jurisdiction on some of the international cases. Thank you for your question. Uh, the Department of Interior has been uh, a part of the delegation. Uh, the international delegation, uh, there is a trilateral, trilateral summit that's held, uh, it's, it's been held in Canada and in Mexico uh, to address uh, violence against indigenous women and children. And so we have been part of that delegation uh, with the Department of Justice and the Department of State, having those uh, trilateral conversations uh, with our bordering countries to uh, address this issue, to, to highlight this issue, and to understand what uh, they are doing uh, across the borders to, uh, to combat this issue inside of their borders. And so it's really been a uh, informative discussion that has taken place. Uh, and I, I do know that the Department of Interior uh, Indian Affairs would like to be at the table if those discussions uh, continue uh, between our governments and their government. Thank you, Mr. Joyce. Maybe that's something you and I can follow up on based on your background with law enforcement. It would, <coughs> it would appear it's a lucky day because I believe a lot of Canadian officials are in town wow. uh, today. Yeah. Uh, coming around to vote. Okay. There you go. Well, let's let, let, let's, let's, let's talk to them about that. Mr. Simpson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Won't, um, let me tell you another table that I would like you at. <laughs> Last summer, I visited the Gay Mine in Fort Hall Indian Reservation and heard concerns about the need to, uh, for further cleanup. And we went out and visited some of the sites that uh, they had uh, mined phosphate out there for years and years. I want to ask you today uh, and invite you, or maybe that even insist, that uh, you be part of a dialogue with your department and other agencies and partners that can team up uh, to create a strategy to clean these these sites up, whether I mean the, the Shoban tribes, the EPA, Bureau of Land Management, uh, the company uh, that did the mining, all of those things, we need to come up with a strategy to clean this up out there. Uh, and so I would like you involved in that if you if you could be. You don't have to respond to that, but I'll be following up on that. Let me ask a question: 
In 2020, uh, the 2020 re request proposes realigning the Office of the Special Trustee to report to the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs. When this proposal was first unveiled last year, the affiliated tribes of the Northwest Indians and the National Congress of American Indians both objected because the department has not has yet to comply with Section 304A3 of the Indian Trust Asset Reform Act, which requires the department to provide Congress with a transition plan and timetable for OST to terminate. When will the department get us that report? Thank you. Uh, that report is going through the internal review process right now, uh, and we are aware that that the the transition report is due to Congress. And uh, my commitment is that it's going to be soon. We are just making sure that uh, the transition and the integration is going to be uh, as effective as possible. We would like it sooner rather than later because it's not too far from now that we'll probably be marking up budgets and wouldn't need to know what that report said. Understood. So, uh, Title II of the Indian Trust Asset Reform Act gives Indian tribes new authorities to direct the management of their trust assets. Based on the department's response to comments and questions submitted by tribes about this authority, however, it appears that the department has taken the very limited position that these agreements are limited to forestry and surface lease resources. The department's responses uh, imply that these agreements could not include other trust resources like agriculture, sand and gravel, minerals, oil and gas, tribal trust funds, to name a few. What is the department's position on, these is on this issue? So with um Thank you for that question. Um, we have a number of mechanisms for tribes to participate in our leasing activities, and so we deal with them one-on-one, -on -one, and also we have a, a support through our Indian Energy Service Center to provide leasing activities and support in devi developing those types of activities. Is there anything specific that you are referring to I was just wondering if it was the department's uh, position that these lease these agreements are limited to forestry and surface lease resources or can they be for other trust responsibilities the tribes have and we've been uh, receiving a wide number of proposals and as they come in then we'll we'll uh, we will analyze what those proposals consist of because sometimes they'll be specific to forestry and other times they'll be including other types of assets Okay, uh, so you're, I, I guess what you're saying is that you don't consider them just forestry and surface lease resources, that they could include agriculture and sand and gravel, minerals, oil and gas, and other tribal trust funds. Is that an accurate statement? As the proposals, so we're evaluating them on a case-by-case -case basis and the requirements under I, ITARA, if they meet ITERA, if they uh, meet those requirements, I certainly, we're going to take a look at how they measure up against the requirements in the legislation. Okay, because I, I would, I would, uh, I mean, you would do that with every request, whether it's for forestry or for uh, surface lease resources, and I suspect you would do that also with the others, but they would not be rejected simply because they didn't meet forestry or surface lease. We we will analyze them uh, and and go through our internal process uh, and to measure them against the requirements under there. Okay. Under that legislation. Thank you. I have a couple other questions that I would. Gentlemen, yield on yeah, this. Yeah, be happy to. So I mentioned earlier that the office of special trustee is supposed to be sun was supposed to sunset in the 90s, and you mentioned ITARA as as the review organization. Um, you're supposed to be reporting to us in two years how to sunset the office. So I think this would be paramount um, now that you've moved it under the Office of Assistant Secretary to get to Mr. Simpson's point on, on how tribes go, wh what happens with, with this process, because this ITAR is supposed to disappear. It was supposed to disappear in the 1990s, which you and I weren't here de dealing with it. We're trying, to, we're trying to make it work now. So d would you anticipate moving he, the, the, the conversations that he's having with you under your office, under the Secretary of Assistant Affairs in a different manner? 
those conversations would would reside in the assistant secretary's office. Yes. Yes. Correct. I had some questions on uh, uh, schools and school safety and that kind of stuff, but people are asking all of those questions. Everything. So I'll submit these two for the record. Yeah. Well, let me just let me just ask you on school safety. Subcommittee was deeply disturbed to learn that GAO uh, from GAO that many schools have gone years without safety inspections. Uh, many of us on this committee have personally visited BIA schools and see the concerns and completely agree that these are not adequate conditions. Can you please update the subcommittee on the actions you have taken from, G from GAO to rectify the school safety concerns and can you please identify what programs and their funding in this budget request is most important to enacting school safety? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and start off and then turn it over to Director Dearman, but we are collaborating with partners across Indian Affairs to address the remaining safety concerns highlighted by the GAO high-risk reports uh, and their recommendations. Uh, we have completed 100% of the audits in 2016, 2017, and 2018, and we are on track to complete 100% of those audits uh, in 2019. And Tony? We've been working closely, as the Assistant Secretary stated, with departments across the interior of Indian Affairs. Um, we've addressed all the outstanding GAO recommendations, and as I've testified earlier, um, we're using them as a roadmap for us to get better as a system. There are some that overlap with Indian Affairs departments that, again, we're working with. Uh, there's two that are still outstanding, uh, four that we have not implemented. Um, 16, 17, or 17, 13, 774 recommendation five, and 15, 121 recommendation one, workforce plan. And we're actually developing that, working with GAO. We've submitted that to them, and we've incorporating the recommendations and look to be submitting that for final closure. The other two that are outstanding are two that we've had to work across agencies, and that is 16, 313, recommendation one. And we have actually worked with GAO on um, making sure that all the safety inspections are done and make sure that the schools, all the, all the findings are mitigated. And GAO has wanted to watch us and monitor the implementation. And if they're satisfied with the implementation, they look to provide closure uh, by December, to the 19th, uh, December 31st of 2019. Um, the other outstanding GAO recommendation regarding safety is 16313 recommendation three. And Again, the department is working with GAO, and we have, are going back and forth with taking the recommendations and look to submit a closure package by May 31st. But we have really addressed uh, the safety and facilities issues that GAO has recommended. An exciting thing is, is, as Assistant Secretary Sweeney stated, we've completed 16, 17, and 18 100 percent safety inspections. This year, we're on track to complete all the safety inspections, but BIE is doing all the uh, school facility safety inspections. So this will be our first year of actually doing all the inspections ourselves. Thank you. And let, let me just say, you got a committee here that is committed to helping you work with us uh, because we've got to address this issue on Indian education. I appreciate your, your comments and your commitment to safety. Um, I find that we are very aligned. Uh, the, what Tony is talking about when he is saying that there are, are many uh, stakeholders across Indian Affairs, when I walked into this position at the end of July, beginning of August of last year, uh, it became clear to me quickly that uh, there were uh, issues that we needed to deal with administratively because of the overlapping of uh, responsibility or the isolation of the responsibility for school safety. And uh, that first week on the job, uh, we had the discussion about what this budget separation would look like and uh, had the staff convened in three-hour tranches to help me understand as an outsider 
let's process map what this looks like in order to get light bulbs at a, in a school. And it was uh, an eye-opening experience and it underscored the need to separate our budgets or the BIA and the BIE budgets. And uh, this is going to be the first year that BIE is doing their, 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 own, their own inspections. But in the past, these inspections have worked 2016, 17, 18, uh, and, and 19 in conjunction with BIA and their leadership as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. watson Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chairman and to the ranking member. And thank you very much for being here for your testimony. Um, education, education readiness is something that's very important to me. And I know that it is very important, particularly, <coughs> particularly to our minority communities, including our Indian communities, to, to get that kind of heads up. Um, and so there was a proposal, there is a proposal in your fiscal year 2020 budget for about $2 million for a pilot project, a preschool summer program for children who are unable to attend traditional preschool programs uh, with a focus on kindergarten ready, readiness. But there really weren't very many details about the proposal in, um, included. And so I'd like for you to provide me more detail on how this pilot will differ from the existing child education, family and child education program, including how the funds will be distributed the existing research to support this pilot as you define it and uh, how new curriculum will be developed, who will staff the pilot and what metrics will be used to determine the pilot success. Thank you for the question. Um, and it's exciting, I'm excited to report out that the Bureau of Indian Education, we have a strategic direction now and it's gonna lead us in a direction, we, you know, as we stated before, 37 directions, 35 years, we need something to keep us on the same momentum and same direction regardless who's in the driver's seat. And through this process, what I'm proud to report is we've heard loud and clear from our tribal leaders that we should not be checking off the box. How can they identify that they've been heard? So we've done five consultations and three listening sessions regarding our strategic direction. We've taken all the comments from tribal leaders and you can go to our website and look at our strategic direction and we've highlighted our tribal leader comments and really tried to incorporate them to where, and if we didn't, we explained why. So really being transparent. But early childhood was one of our goals in working with our strategic, or through our strategic direction. What we're doing right now is we're identifying locations, working with tribes, because partnering with tribes is very critical in BIE. But we're work identifying locations that don't have an early childhood uh, program. And we're not going to duplicate services, but we're working to identify the tribes. And then we're going to partner with the tribes to see how we can structure uh, early childhood program to really start tracking the kids before they come in, do some pre-assessments, do some assessments and track the kids because one thing that BIE we have not had in the past is accurate data. We've got to do a better job and we will do a better job of tracking our data. So we're right now we're in the process of den identifying the pilot sites and then we'll partner with the tribes because again, we've heard loud and clear, there's no one design or one fits all program or system and we really need to tailor it working with our tribes and their needs. In, in some way, thank you, in some way are you looking uh, to provide more individualized um, home-based um, services because it says for those who've not been able to attend the traditional preschool programs, so I'm wondering how we are accomplishing that, how are we getting to, to them? We actually, you know, again, we have a, uh, our family and child education, our FACE program within our system where we do home visits. And again, we don't want to duplicate what's currently in place. And again, if that's something when we sit down with our tribes and they say, yes, we want to have a program where you're coming into homes, we, that would be something we'd work through. Or is them. it just trying to figure out even just smaller, smaller programs based in communities that don't seem to be as mobile and able to get into those uh, already existing programs? And Really, yeah. again, we're just really trying to identify locations because we have so many tribes that are isolated that don't have access. And um, again, just Let working me through the partnerships. Thank you. Let me ask you, how long do you think this assessment process is going to take? We are anticipating having some um, locations identified this year and start setting down and developing the plans with 
the mm -hmm. tribes that we've identified. Do you have a, a, an idea uh, how many children or how many tribes are omitted and in need of this sort of new push? Not currently, but that's what we're, we're working on. Okay, yes. okay. So you will keep us advised. Exactly. Okay. Yes, Thank absolutely. you so much. The other thing in the budget had to do with the proposed $1 million for a new line for replacement and uh, uh, new employee housing, and it's sort of like, how much does something like that cost? What are we planning on? What is your, you know, expenditure plan? How will we know how you're going to use this? Great question. Thank you. Good catch. <laughs> uh, this is something that we've really needed throughout our school system, because in the past, there wasn't a line item for new construction, and all the quarters were attached to new school construction. And again, working across the departments within Indian Affairs, we will get a facility condition index, we refer to as FCI, and we're gonna look at our sites to see where we most need replacement housing and quarters, and really start targeting where we uh, can utilize the quarters based on assessments. But because in talking to the tribes, um, we've had quarters that have gotten to the point of where they need to be replaced, but there wasn't a funding line to do that. And that's exciting for us because we really feel like that's going to help us recruit and retain okay. our teachers. Do you have prototypes and have any idea how much these replacements will cost? You know, that's something I know that we will have working through uh, the FMC, Division of Facilities and Management Construction, because that's the data that they'll house there, and they'll have the, the square footage, the cost of replacement, they'll have all that information. Is it interested in knowing? Okay. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Mahdi. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you folks for being here today. Um, I've been on the committee for I don't know how long, seems like a long time until today with the, with the warm greeting. Thank you. I feel young again, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair. Um, <laughs> but I've never voted against an appropriation for BIA, and they haven't gone down while I've been here. And we've done the work to support big Indian country and stuff like that, and we should do that work. I mean, you gotta provide services where most of your customers, if you will, are. Um, but, but, but I gotta tell you, I've, I've got just two memos here from two visits that I made uh, just in the last two weeks. One is, is with the uh, uh, Carson City BIA agency, and another one is with the Walker Lake uh, Paiute tribe. Met with the chairwoman, some of the tribal council members. And I can tell you that, that, that as the person who represents those folks, and especially on this committee, where you talk about issues that they face that are not in big Indian country, and not where there's a lot of cohesiveness, not that that's a, a, a derogatory thing, but just getting routine things done. Like on both of these, I've got a topic, realty issues. I've got people in tribes who are complaining that they have done everything they need to do to purchase their property, but yet they are waiting for conveyances for sometimes five and 10 years. And you go, well, that sounds kind of funny because if I pay my house off or my lot off, then I should be able to go get financing or in one instance, apply for USDA rural development grants where quite frankly, the administrators of that say, well, we're not giving you a grant. We can't prove through the BIA title process that you own the ground. So that's not the purpose of this, but it's like communication, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's uh, tribal justice, whether it's juvenile justice, juvenile detention, realty, health care, all that stuff. My experience has been, this is not criticism, I'm just saying my experience has been, it's like, okay, well, we'll call somebody from BIA and have them come in and give us a briefing. And it's better now than it was. I mean, it used to be, it's like, you really had to get lucky to, you know, get somebody. That's past history and a few years back, so forget all that. But I'm sitting here as I think about this and, and go, I have a request for you folks to think about, and that is this. Because I've got probably as many tribes as any other district, but not as many people in those tribes, I'm thinking that sometime in August, I'd like to host a, not a town hall meeting, but a meeting with tr tribal, you know, chair people and whatever in Nevada with somebody at the secretarial level, somebody from Phoenix, somebody from, um, from New Mexico, whoever the regional people are where it's like, wherever those folks go with that conversation, where there's somebody there that can, that can speak generally, in, uh, in other words, to get a snapshot of Nevada BIA issues, 
because I can tell you that my honest feeling is, so I'm out there, and I'm out there for two hours with Amber Torres, who's the tribal chairwoman at Walker Lake, and I got all this stuff. It's like, okay, I'll talk to BIA about this. I'll talk to them about that. I'll talk. And, and you know what? I got to tell you, and maybe it's my fault, but it's like it isn't really progressing. Now, maybe the answer to some of these things is no, but just getting a tri a, a, an agency-level thing going, here's what we can do to help you, here's what we can't do to help you. Um, and so um, I'll follow up with you, Madam Secretary, and, and, and just say, hey, let's pick a day in August where you come out. It can be at Winnemucca, which has got a nice, interesting native name, and, and the chairwoman has actually spent the night in Winnemucca, on official business, I might add. Uh, but, but anyhow, the location is, is wherever you say, we'll, we'll get you the room, we'll feed everybody, we'll do whatever. But just sit down and go, here you go. Here's the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Here's the tribes. You folks talk about your issues, and let's see wh where we go from there. I just think it's more effective than me trying to throw darts, and, you know, this, this thing comes up so it gets the attention, and, and they're all global things. But, but I think it might be an efficient way at least to get a snapshot of what's going on in Nevada. I appreciate the invitation, and, and as we get to know each other, uh, you'll find that I, I have an open-door policy uh, within Indian Affairs, and I am working very hard to build a collaborative team that is responsive to the requests of Indian Country, so I welcome the opportunity uh, to work with you on this. Okay, we'll go to work. Thank you very much. I yield back, Madam Chair. Ms. Sweeney, if you obviously take you out to look at sage grouse early in the morning, <laughs> sometimes he doesn't find any. <laughs> <laughs> we, substituted, we substituted with antelope, Madam Chair. I know, I know, and it was wonderful watching you try to look for the, <laughs> the, the hands, the hands uh, as, as you described them. Um, next time I'll go with uh, Audubon. <laughs> yeah, probably <laughs> no. a good idea. It was a, was a great, great visit, and um, I look forward to following up on, on how that goes. I'm going to ask uh, questions I said earlier about Tawahi. So over the last five years, the Tawahi Initiative has been transformative. It's uh, helped selected tribal nations approach child, family, and community welfare in a comprehensive way rather than try to silo everything. And because of this, I've personally seen the impact within Minnesota's Red Lake Nation, which is still working day and night to do even better by its people, but it's by having uh, this committee strongly supporting this initiative, they're, they're starting to see inroads and starting to see things happen. And in fact, other tribal nations were uh, asking, you know, we want to be part of this initiative because you, you know, communities have to be treated as, as, as whole entities. But there are some concerns about how the BIA has administered the Tuahi uh, funds. Last year, the Inspector General the Department of Interior found significant records management problems at the Office of Self-Governance, poor execution of funding met methodology uh, at the Office of Indian Services, an absence of regular communication and policy procedures at both the Office of Self-Governance and the Office of Indian Services, led to inaccurate funding um, self-governance uh, tribes through TWI. Uh, the OGI made seven recommendations, four of which the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs concurred uh, and agreed to take action on. So if you could, and we can get into more detail uh, with this later, but if you could maybe give us an idea of where you are with the status of correcting actions to ensure the accuracy in funding to the self-tribal uh, governance. Uh, because uh, as part of the fiscal year 2019 appropriations, um, BAA was directed to report to the committee within 90 days of performance measures used to monitor and track Hawaii's effectiveness. Um, you've got about 20 days before the report's due, so I know I'm asking you for a sneak preview uh, on uh, any measures that you can share because we're getting ready now to go to our subcommittee on markups. So you can maybe tell us what you've learned about applying metrics and the effectiveness of the initiative. Sneak you, and then we'll you. look forward to the full report, but sure. a sneak preview would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for raising that issue. And this is a part of the looking under the hood inside of Indian Affairs uh, that I have been engaged in with my team. 
Uh, and, and you raised some very valid points. We've convened our Office of Self-Governance, the Office of Indian Services, and the budget staff to review past Tawahi fund allocations. And uh, we're, we're looking at uh, creating a standard and an, an agreed upon methodology for calculating these allocations. Uh, we're also planning for targeted investments to improve our funding databases, and that is uh, a very critical component, is being able to track uh, the, the funding and uh, to, to have a system where there's transparency. And so uh, I hear you with the concerns that you're, you're raising about how we have administered the program to date. Uh, we are taking a deep dive and a look at how we can improve those services, our tracking mechanisms, and the allocations and accountability to tribes. So we're going to see some improvement, but not everything, because you're still in the process of moving forward. Did I hear that correctly? We, we are. You're, we'll you're see going some to tracking, some tracking, some yes. reporting, but not everything because you're implementing the report as you're trying to do this right now. Yes. Okay. Look forward to that. Mr. Joyce. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. One of the uh, concerns for uh, just about every state and, and law enforcement jurisdiction is the opioid crisis, and I know it's hit the uh, Indian community just as well, just as hard. But could you tell the subcommittee how the jurisdictional complexities and resulting challenges to prosecution continue to make American Indian and Alaska Native communities disproportionately vulnerable to infiltration by drug cartels? It's a very complex question. And uh, what I can tell you is the jurisdictional complexities can be a barrier for Indian country. Uh, what we have found success in is hiring additional BIA drug agents because they have the authority to enforce uh, drug or criminal uh, viol violations on reservations for non-natives and uh, native offenders. Uh, the budget proposal includes resources to hire and equip additional BIA enforcement agents and to expand the uh, DOI opioid task force functions. Um, we have found success in the uh, operations that we have conducted thus far in Indian country, but uh, with respect to the jurisdictional challenges, to, to go back and, and answer your question again, is it, it can be a barrier and it is difficult. Now, how would the proposed establishment of mobile enforcement teams allow the BIA to strengthen enforcement capabilities and better address this crisis throughout Indian country? So the mobile enforcement teams uh, have been very successful and it allows for our uh, BIA drug agents to focus on Indian country and that criminal activity on the reservations or within our tribal communities. And what that means is we're not taking uh, law enforcement officers off of duty and other functions, uh, but the, the, the MET teams uh, provide that laser-like focus on this, um, this issue plaguing Indian country. <clears throat> They're dispatched, I take it as needed throughout the communities, it's, it's, it's brought up or you find that there's an unfortunately increase in say overdoses or yes. problems like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, does the BIA support efforts to equip first responders with n naloxone? And if so, how does the t uh, FY20 budget support that request? We do, uh, we do support uh, providing our officers with uh, Narcan kits, and we uh, look forward to continuing to work with IHS uh, in providing the appropriate amounts of training necessary for our tribal police officers uh, and the um, Office of Justice Service law enforcement officers uh, to administer those kids in uh, times that are necessary. 
One of the things I found is that, uh, you know, obviously a person who's uh, taking the drugs, it's a, uh, usually a felony, you know, depending on what they're ingesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're an addict. And one thing I ask when I go home, and, and what's working? You know, how are you treating the addicts? Or have you found anything that's been working in the uh, uh, your community that has been advantageous or something we should focus on? Thank you for that observation. Uh, one thing that I have heard uh, throughout Indian Country in the various fora that I have been engaged uh, is the need for uh, the, the effects, the need for infrastructure to address the effects of the opioid crisis. And that, that means uh, the follow-on uh, services for for addicts and I do know that there are some organizations uh, in Indian country that are working to address this issue uh, but I do believe that more can be done because it would seem uh, returning the person to where they came from after 28 days isn't necessarily the cure there has to be some other treatment program especially in a community as tight say as the Indian communities is to uh, some type of longer term rehab. So it would be interesting to, to hear it, uh, as you progress how that's working for you. Well, support services for addicts who return uh, to their communities is critical for uh, long term sustainability uh, in a clean livelihood, uh, risk averse, or uh, less engaging in less risky behavior. Uh, and Indian Affairs is committed to working with IHS on these types of issues. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Pingree. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, let me follow up a little bit on that question because it sort of feeds into one of the things I wanted to ask you about. Um, certainly, um, we have heard a lot from our constituents in Indian country about the opioid addiction crisis. and. Um, what has been and hasn't been working. And one of the things that we hear a lot about are the wellness courts, um, as well as enforcement and some of the things that the ranking member talked about. But um, one of the values of the rank, uh, wellness courts is that they help the participant to deal with addiction issues, and, and many of the tribes have tri uh, applied for SAMHSA uh, funding for direct treatment, but it also deals with other things to help get a person's life stabilized, housing, job opportunities, the very things that you mentioned. Um, but um, there doesn't seem to be any funding available at the department to help specifically to cover costs associated with the wellness courts. The tribes can use tribal priority allocation funding for tribal courts, but that's different. Is there any other funding that you could talk about? And let me just tie that into a couple, another issue that um, is, is about the court system. And that's um, uh, the recent passage of the VAWA Act in the House for the first time included the Maine and Alaskan tribes, which is, of course, very meaningful to people in my um, state. Um, but one of the concerns is that with the underfunding of tribal courts, um, which I understand the BIA submitted a report to Congress in 2017 indicating that tribal courts are currently funded as a, at a dismal 3% of estimated need, which doesn't sound very good. Um, so one of the things that would be important is to have that adequate funding so that um, under the VAWA provisions, there's sufficient funding. So can you just talk about the wellness courts, this funding, that kind of funding in general? So the we have a very robust uh, tribal justice services inside the Office of Justice Services, and uh, they are uh, committed to addressing these issues inside of Indian Country. Uh, with respect to your question, can you help me understand, is there anything specific uh, outside of the, the budget um, number that you had raised. Um, and I understand that, um, you know, funding in the budget is a matter for this committee, and I think there's a lot of commitment in this committee to um, not aligning ourselves with the budget cuts and hopefully putting more funding in. Maybe part of my suggestion is that 
for this committee's consideration that there needs to be more funding um, on the court side. Um, I guess when it comes to the wellness courts, which have been seen as a specific asset in treating um, the opioid crisis, um, because there doesn't seem to be specific funding, maybe we can follow up with you about other ways to do that. But another um, part of the question would be, have you looked at all, um, have been able to analyze um, the impacts of these wellness courts and if there should be um, more attention to them in terms of combating the um, substance abuse crisis? So the Office of Justice Services under the Tribal Law and Order Act uh, produces a report uh, that is submitted to Congress. And I, so I know that uh, internally we do have uh, folks who are, who are tracking these issues. Uh, what I'm happy to do is, is to provide you with additional information uh, and, and to get back to the committee specifically on your question. Sure, and I know you're not gonna have every piece of information in front of you, so I appreciate mm -hmm. all the questions we throw at you. And since I have a couple more seconds, let me throw one more there, and I, I don't necessarily expect you to um, have all the information on this, but the um, American Indian An Agricultural Resource Management Acts uh, allows BIA to assist tribes in the development of agricultural resource management plans for tribal lands. And we've come across a couple of conversations with tribes in our state who have um, agricultural land that they need more assistance in helping to plan and, and develop um, economic development plans for it, you know, what would be the best thing to be growing on it. Um, because of climate change, some of our, our, our tribal communities have lands that may need to transition into another crop. And it doesn't seem to be um, sufficient funding, particularly for the planning of that. I know some tribes have taken advantage of the NRCS through the USDA. I just don't know how much you coordinate there. And I think there is a growing interest in food sovereignty and, and you know, uh, growing food resources. So I imagine this is something that other tribes in other places are confronting and just wonder what resources are available. <coughs> Thank you for that question. Um, currently, we're in the final stages of developing an MOU with the USDA to capture the opportunities under the Farm Bill and identify where we can uh, collaborate with our tribes and tribal leaders and our tribal members that are interested in these um, opportunities. And as soon as that's passed, we'll provide you a copy. We also included the Farm Service Agency for the opportunity for the financing of the various activities tribes and tribal members are seeking support. That's great. So I'll look forward to looking at that, and I'm also a member of the Agricultural Appropriations Committee, so we'll be anxious to look at the ways there can be collaboration. So thank you, Madam Chair. A very senior member who a is very happy. senior, uh, yes. You know, uh, but it, it, it goes, to, goes to show how Indian countries interdependence on what happens in other budgets. And so please um, take advantage of Ms. Pingree's expertise and passion for, for farming. Um, Stramady, do you have another question? Um, Mr. Joyce? Um, I recently met with the Gil River Indians community and they were talking about this uh, school that they had constructed and it was part of a project. and. and uh, it, you know, you would uh, provided funding up to two million for demonstration project for the first construction lease by project at the department. What is the status of project, and is this a model that can be used throughout Indian country? Thank you. Uh, I, I'm happy to provide uh, a response and tell Mr. Dearman if you have any additional uh, color. I'd like to lean on you for that. Uh, we're in discussions with Gila River about their project, uh, and we can't comment uh, specifically on that effort uh, because the discussions are not are not final. However, we are encouraged by this. Uh, we recognize the the lease potential uh, that the 105L leases offer, and uh, it's a it's a new way. It's a new tool to support infrastructure investment in Indian country. And so uh, we are supportive of the opportunities that it, it presents. I think the only thing I, I'd really like to add is, is the, uh, again, as I stated earlier, is the relationship and the partnerships of our administration working with tribes, because this is exciting. Um, mm -hmm. And there, we are still working out the details, but I'm excited about 
you know, the possibilities with this because the tribes have stepped up and they're, you know, they're looking at, hey, what can we do to work with the government and making sure our kids are taken care of? I, I thought it was pretty uh, good project myself and a, and a model way of going about this going forward. But is the department requesting funding for this program in 2020? We haven't. And uh, what we're finding is that we're playing catch up to congressional action. Define catch up to congressional action. So the 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 action taken place by Congress uh, was post our uh, 2020 budget uh, formulation. This money was allocated in years past, though, correct? Right. The 2020 request does not specifically request new funds for this effort. Okay. All right. Thank you. I yield back. We, we need to follow up on that too because um, as you know, there is a school construction list. This is a new way of looking at it. We have a tribe ready to stand up. We're looking at initiatives that, that we do with, with healthcare, but we need to make sure that the limited allocation and the fact that the president didn't ask for um, uh, funding into education as this committee would have hoped he would have, as we have to do, that we have enough dollars to meet um, all of our obligations. But I think this is an exciting opportunity um, uh, to move forward on. So we look forward to working with that. Mr. Joyce, I'm going to submit some questions for the record. Uh, uh, one on uh, public safety and justice construction, the Office of Special Trustee that we had, uh, I mentioned in my earlier remarks, uh, self-government leases, education construction, uh, following up on climate change, which is something that um, I know being from Alaska, sea level rise, whatever we want to call it, right? Alaska Native Americans are, they're, they're living it firsthand. Um, and we, I know there's been displacement of communities there. So we, this is something our community, our, our, our uh, committee wants to focus on. The Indian Guaranteeing Load Program, um, the boarding school in Oregon, we had a bit of a discussion with uh, following up on that. And then um, I think Ms. Wasserman Schultz asked a great um, uh, question on uh, the, the childhood pilot program, and I think this committee wants to understand it better because we have programs, uh, we have BASE, uh, which is funded kind of out of here, but then we have Head Start, and now we have a new program, and I think this could be very exciting, very innovative, but we need to have a clear understanding of what it is, and so does Indian country, so that they can see what we're going at. So we're going to follow up with some questions on that. And then if you have some questions too, Mr. Joyce, uh, please feel, um, you know, just, just we'll get them in. Um, I have uh, three things I'd like to um, uh, uh, touch on. Johnson O'Malley. Last year, uh, and I mentioned this in my opening remarks, the Johnson O'Malley Supplemental Indian Education Program Modernization Act. The law required the secretary to publish the preliminary report, uh, and I said we're close to the, n the 90 days. Um, were you able to um, consult with uh, um, eligible entities and, you know, as directed in the statute to determine which of the three sources of data you can use. You can use census, you can use tribal enrollment, there's other things that you can do. Can you kind of um, tell me, because the report's uh, coming out, were you able to work with tribal leaders to determine how you're going to conduct uh, the, the, the count for Johnson O'Malley? So we're, we're in the process of engaging uh, with tribes and doing tribal consultation. Okay, so so you'll have the consultation done in enough time to get to get the to to reach out to get the count done. Then that is the intent. Good. I look for I look forward to it because it the, the, it went undercounted for as you know decades and decades and affected um, you know uh, Indian country's youth, but they're the youth of our country. They're, they're the future for all of us. So we want to make sure that we give them all the tools in the toolbox in, uh, to be successful. I want to talk about reorganization. Um, so the president budget uh, proposes to establish a Bureau of Indi Indian Education, as you said, as a separate bureau, uh, and it'll deport, it will report directly to you. And um, you, you've kind of talked about it a little bit. We've talked about it in our office. But could you maybe, um, maybe just, just kind of for the record, describe um, some of the benefits you see of this proposal 
and how it's going to uh, work with the Government Accountability Office's recommendations on how the tribal consultation can, uh, you know, happen so that the tribes are on board with, uh, with, with your, your decision to separate, uh, to kind of separ separate the Bureau of Indian Affairs out and then have, have it work with you to be more efficient. Thank you. Uh, the budget separation, I think, well, uh, let me back up. The budget separation will provide more transparency and accountability uh, for BIE into the uh, facilities management and the acquisition and the safety for uh, BIE school infrastructure and to provide a safe environment for the, the children that we serve. And so <coughs> in that vein, it was absolutely necessary to uh, separate the, the, the BIA and the BIE budgets. Uh, with respect to consultation, this has uh, gone through extensive consultation over a period of several years. Uh, it was also uh, litigated the, uh, and and then uh, BIE formulated their strategic plan. Uh, there have been several conversations about improving efficiencies at BIE. Uh, so we have, uh, throughout the course of the last six months or so, uh, provided information to uh, tribal leadership uh, and uh, explained that this budget separation needed to to happen. Is there anything additional that, that you'd like uh, from Indian Affairs? Well, just, just as some of the reorganizations have taken place, I think that this, this one appears to have had more consultation, as you said. There was also a court case kind of involved mm -hmm. and with, with litigation in it. But, um, you know, we also need to be part of the, the the consult on it sure. um, a, as appropriators and uh, you know your, your conversations with authorizers and, and that too to make sure that what you put together um, doesn't um, doesn't raise expectations and then and then dis d disappoint because I think you have very um, wonderful ideas good goals um, that I think this committee agrees with but we need to kind of see it in paper because just as the administration will be held accountable, we'll be held accountable on how we appropriate the dollars for it. So we look forward to, to, to working with you on it, learning more about it. And then we also, as you do consultation with tribes, you know, we, we consult with them as well. So look forward to working on it. So that kind of leads me to my, <coughs> my next uh, kind of big picture topic. Um, the recent shutdown more than ever highlighted the urgent need uh, in Indian country to have advanced appropriations, whether it's health care, whether it's uh, as, is what we're focusing on. But I also think it's important for, um, for schools, too, because schools need to stay open. There needs to be, you know, pe teachers need to know they're going to get paid. We need to know the buses are going to run, all those things. But we've been uh, uh, first looking at doing advanced appropriations for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And we have a bill, a lot of us are, the majority of us are on this, uh, H.R. 1128. Mr. Cole's had one in the past for mandatory funding. We support each other's ideas just as we did with Mr. Simpson when he was working on fire funding. Um, we, we just, we, we want change and we want it to be good change. Um, so we've got the advanced appropriations bill uh, um, out there for BIA, BIE, Indian Health Services. So what I'd like to know is what do we need to do to get you ready to do this? And are you as excited about it as members of Congress are so we don't see our Native brothers and sisters go through all this um, angst and, um, you know, turmoil and sometimes it, it's it's life altering, life changing, and not for the good when we go through shutdown. So, um, what do you what do you, what are some of the resources that you will need to have in place to do advanced um, appropriations? What can we do to work together on this for the good of Indian Country? So you mentioned the shutdown, and uh, we certainly understand and have heard from tribal leadership the impacts that the shutdown has had on our uh, tribal communities. And I have issued a Dear Tribal Leader letter that has was sent out about three weeks ago uh, 
uh, asking for their direct uh, feedback on the impacts that the shutdown uh, had on their communities to help me understand as the leader of Indian Affairs uh, to, to gain a full picture of, of those impacts so that as uh, we move forward and are faced with very difficult situations that may uh, arise in the future that, that we are making informed decisions based on their feedback. Uh, with respect to advanced appropriations, I want to just mention that the BIE uh, school system, they are forward funded uh, and uh, the current legislation that's out there, uh, we're evaluating and I would like to get back with you on uh, specifics uh, f to answer your request for what do you need what do we need from this committee? I don't have an answer for you today, but I would like to have the opportunity to provide you with a more in-depth answer. Fair enough. With, uh, with the Bureau of Indian uh, Education, does that include construction, if you're in the middle school construction with advanced appropriations? During this past shutdown, um, we had a situation with Santa Rosa Ranch to where we had to pull people together, and that was during the shutdown. Um, depends on uh, in that situation yes we continued working I can't say enough about our dedicated employees because a lot of the employees that were working on that project were doing it and not getting paid um, so I, I really think that that is based on the need if it's an emergency absolutely um, if it's not I would have to find out and get back to you as far as how that how that falls within DFMC right but contractors working in that project wouldn't get paid to my understanding, they, they would not. I think yeah. all the work stops in the shutdown. Yeah. That's what, yeah. and, a lot, and we're trying to uh, encourage through contracting m minority and, and Native American opportunities um, too. So um, I appreciate that. I know everybody was doing their level best during the shutdown. And Mr. Joyce and I don't want another one, right? Right. Right. So Mr. Joyce, anything else? Nothing further, ma'am. Well, thank you very much. This has thank been you. very informative. We look forward to hearing uh, back from you and having conversations as we move forward. Thank you again, Ms. Sweeney, Mr. Dearman, and Ms. Blackhair. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Stay warm enough? Oh, yeah. I have my blanket on. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would